Uh, I uh, thought maybe it would be useful to remind everybody uh, how elegant these guys look. Uh, isn't that an awesome picture, that painting of the founders? What happened to it? Went off again. Well, that's okay. I want to go back up here. Yeah. Well. Okay. I just, I we were speaking ill of uh, their work product, and I thought maybe uh, you ought to remind yourself of this uh, elegant portrait of uh, what was going on in Philadelphia and, and uh, how handsome they looked and how wise they seemed uh, to uh, those who were involved in their work. And uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that there was a lot of compromise going on there uh, among conflicting uh, aspirations, ambitions, values, and it wasn't easy to come up with anything. And they weren't all that proud of their handiwork. They didn't think it was perfect. Uh, they thought it needed changes, but they weren't, couldn't agree on what they were. And I think, to some extent, we're inevitably in that shape today. And uh, if you thought about picking up, uh, you know, an equal number of our fellow citizens and asking them to do what these guys to do, I'm not at all sure I'd be very happy with the result. Some of the suggestions made here uh, earlier are ones with which I would strongly disagree. Uh, but I suspect they would disagree with the ones that, that I might propose as well. Um, for example, and just, uh, the, I don't have a picture of the, of the guys who wrote the California Constitution, because it was the people of California who wrote it, mostly, by uh, referendum uh, and initiatives and that sort of thing, and they made a really lousy state constitution. I mean, it really stinks. Uh, and the, the state government doesn't work anymore, uh, because people kept adding things to it by popular referendum that uh, made the state virtually ungovernable. Uh, and. Uh, uh, th I don't know how they're going to get out of that pickle, but in any event, that, that's a, a caution about thinking about uh, opening the whole process up and doing it all over again. I think we, uh, we have to think about it seriously because I do agree with those who uh, uh, are of the view that the system is broken and something's got to be done about it. I, 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 I don't think that can be denied. I think we really do have some really serious problems with the way uh, the Congress of the United States functions, and indeed with the way uh, the federal courts function. Uh, but uh, it's not an easy fix, and my hope would be, my hope is that if we start talking about, seriously, about Article 5 and an Article 5 convention, that maybe we could get Congress to step up and address some issues that they are presently too timid to quite square away and deal with, including their own problems, like filibusters, just for example. Uh, could they think a little bit about what they've done with the filibuster law and uh, if they would do away with that, maybe that would ease our pain a little bit. Uh, I, I know a number of congressmen that I, for whom I have a very high regard. I think they're really uh, public servants uh, who want to do the right thing, but they are under enormous kinds of, of crossfires and pressures that uh, lead to a lot of bizarre results. And we think about Congress as being broken, and a lot of people believe that it is, uh, that people aren't wrong. These guys are under a great deal of pressure uh, to, I mean, if you want to be a congressman, you've got to spend a lot of time worrying about where your money is going to come from uh, to run a campaign. Uh, campaigning for congressional office is a, is a messy, ugly business. And uh, now, uh, if you're going to correct that, you're going to have to think about how that's going to be done. Uh, but it is, uh, it is the case that, uh, yes, Congress is broken, but it's not so easy to figure out exactly how to fix it. Uh, the state legislatures aren't necessarily any better. They've got the same kinds of problems in trying to deal uh, with um, campaign finance and campaign money. Uh, what are you going to do about the state legislatures? We, we have the same problems at the, even at the local level. In fact, probably the weakest forms of government in the United States may be sometimes the local zoning boards uh, who get pushed around something pathetic. I mean, a, a, a real, real estate developer uh, can often uh, uh, get control of a zoning board. That happens lots of places, lots of times. And uh, there are states in which everybody understands the zoning board's totally corrupt. 
Uh, and it's just a matter of which realtor is going to pay how much money to get the zone that, that he or she wants uh, in order to get something done. So localization is not necessarily uh, a great answer to all of our problems. Uh, I, I believe in local government. I think it's a really good idea, but it, there are some real problems with uh, the conduct of local government that uh, you can't dismiss when you start thinking about constitutional conventions and rewriting uh, uh, con uh, con uh, state constitutions. Uh, it is, uh, to some extent, our problems with the federal government are uh, inevitable consequences of what happened in the 19th century when we became uh, a nation. And, you know, the, the, these guys uh, writing constitutions weren't worried about what the, what the consequences of the national railroad system were. We be developed a national economy. When you have a national economy, somebody's got to regulate it. Uh, you can't let business manage a national economy. Businessmen have their motives and their needs and their they're going to do things that require a measure of regulation. And the states can't regulate uh, interstate business. Even if you authorize them to do it, it doesn't work because the market operates against the effectiveness of any kind of regulatory scheme. So uh, those are all, all problems and I don't, to which I do not have uh, very good solutions. Uh, but at the same time, I do think uh, uh, there are problems that Congress could and should be regulating and they're not, and to some extent, uh, that is a, uh, a consequence of uh, this organization. Uh, I refer to it here as the Temple of Karnak. Uh, that is uh, a phrase attached to it by Louis Brandeis, who, in my, to my taste, is the greatest of our 20th century justices, was Louis Brandeis, and he refused to move his office into this building. He said that building is not the right structure for the Supreme Court of the United States. It's going to give everybody a fat head, and they're going to go out and make a whole lot of decisions that don't need to be made uh, to uh, gratify themselves in one way or another. And uh, we ought to have modest offices so we can remember uh, our place in the world. And you recall, the Supreme Court of the United States used to have to sit in the basement of the Capitol building. Uh, and they moved out. This was uh, William Howard Taft's uh, vision to create this palace. Uh, and uh, that does uh, affect the way they do think about themselves and think about the things that uh, they, uh, they have accomplished. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court does overbear, uh, in my view, and often does so in a variety of different kinds of ways. But, uh, the, the most serious, from the point of view of the present discussion and the quality of our, our government and how effective it works, is that the Supreme Court of the United States has really screwed up the political system. Uh, uh, the most recent event that may be fresh in everybody's mind is the Citizens United case decided this year in January. It became a, a topic of conversation at the President's uh, State of the Union address but it was an absolutely outrageous application of the First Amendment saying that corporations have an unlimited right to contribute money uh, to uh, uh, candidates. And uh, I say, I, I know some pretty good guys who are congressmen who are really would like to do their job, but they have to, what, how are they supposed to do that in a world in which campaign finance is as crucial as it is? To some extent, that's a product of television. Uh, I think uh, in, in my lifetime, I observed the cost of running campaigns go out the roof, and the, there were technological reasons for that. If you were running for office in 1920, uh, it w there, were, there were uses for money, but nothing like what happened by 1960, 1970, uh, and the price began to take off, and campaign uh, funding became, becomes a critical thing. And now the Supreme Court of the United States is saying corporations, corporations are citizens. Uh, and even as far as we can tell at this point, they haven't ruled on this, it would appear to be the case that even a foreign corporation uh, could be contributing money to a, uh, a congressional campaign, which is particularly peculiar uh, because uh, we don't allow American firms to get a tax deduction for uh, contributions to foreign candidates. Uh, because we recognize that's a form of corruption uh, to have a foreign company come in and buy, buy, influence the government. 
Uh, but in any event, uh, corporations uh, are, are on their own, and, and the whole idea of unlimited, unrestrained campaign finance is nuts. Uh, money is not speech. Justice Stevens was wise enough to make that point over and over again, uh, but uh, the court didn't, didn't get the message, and they continued to spread the, the principle out uh, further and further so that it becomes very difficult to regulate uh, campaign finance in any form. And this is not just a problem for the federal government, it's the state legislatures and uh, you in Michigan as well as we in North Carolina uh, are uh, conscious of the fact that uh, it's not just our legislator, legislators who have to go out campaigning for money. What do you do if you want to be a judge? Uh, if you want to sit on the Supreme Court of Michigan, you better find some money. Uh, it's not uh, absolutely critical. I think Michigan is a state where we had the wonderful experience a few years ago of having some very well-funded candidates lose. Uh, and wasn't that a good thing, just on principle, to have, a, have some well-funded candidates not able to buy the office. But uh, uh, it is, uh, that is one of the things that's going on in our, our uh, universe. And, it's been a problem in North Carolina. One of the things we've done in North Carolina is arrange a scheme for public funding of judicial campaigns. Uh, and it's, so far it's working okay, but it's very fragile and very vulnerable. And uh, the Supreme Court may throw the whole thing in the ditch. Uh, one of the things we were doing is providing a little, uh, if you didn't want to be in the public funding system, you could do it on your own. But if you spent too much money, then we'd give our funded candidate a little bonus also. And I got a, a letter this last week from the John Locke Society in Raleigh saying, that's unconstitutional, you can't do that. Uh, you're diminishing the value of the right of somebody to spend money on a judicial campaign, and therefore uh, you, you're not entitled to balance the, the uh, cost. Well, I think that's wrong, but in any event, our, our system has now been adopted in New Mexico and Wisconsin and West Virginia, and maybe that helps, and maybe Michigan ought to be thinking about it. I don't know, but it does, it, it does take some of the pressure, at least off the judges, uh, to find campaign funding. 